All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to welcome Tim Pollard, who is up in Billings, Montana. How are you doing, Tim? <laughs> I'm well, John. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're the first person we've had on from Billings, Montana, actually. I'm I'm pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> Certainly <laughs> the first Englishman from Montana. I yeah, exactly. That. Yeah, an Englishman in Montana. That sounds like a movie or a book. Yeah. <laughs> All right then. Uh, and so Tim is the CEO of Oratium. Uh, helps equip leaders to tell their story in powerful and compelling ways. In certain knowledge, that extraordinary messaging leads to extraordinary outcomes. So what we're going to talk today about is sales messaging. Um, why it fails and how to fix it. So um, mm -hmm. actually, just let's bottom line this, uh, Tim, for a moment. When you say sales messaging, just uh, give me a definition of that. Yeah, sales messaging is the story that your commercial team takes out to the customer. It can be early first stage sales interaction down to a you know, late stage sales meeting. It can be a high level C-level conversation, perhaps bring in, you know, a high-level description of a, of a high-end solution to a bigger business problem right down to a low-level product message. But it's basically how B2B organizations communicate fundamentally their value to their customers. Right. And so what are, what are some of the major uh, mistakes or fails that people, uh, that, that people make, unfortunately? Because it, it is something that a lot of people still struggle with. Uh, no question. In fact, most companies get it somewhere between wrong and, and horribly wrong. Um, <laughs> if you look at it, I just grabbed this before I came in here. This is a classic sales deck. This is a well-known technology company. doesn't matter who it is, but everyone on this call is using their technology right now. The, the problem is not PowerPoint. The problem is actually the way we think about the intellectual structure or message, which we then embed usually into a PowerPoint. PowerPoint does, however, create or encourage really stupid habits. So actually, you do want to stay away from it. But typically, what's going wrong is probably three things, right? And almost all organizations make some combination of these three mistakes. First is too much information. We just are lunatic in terms of how much we pack into our story. Our motives are good. You know, I've got a complex solution. Uh, I want to cover all my bases. I want to deal with every possible question. And, 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 and unfortunately, those good motives lead to the outcome of almost always of just complete cognitive overload. The second problem with most messaging is it's confusing or perhaps better put the value of what we're offering is unclear. It's just the customer does not leave the meeting and, and just feel like oh, that is really compelling. I need to do that. They often sort of what exactly was this about? Why exactly would I care? Sometimes that's because it's too much information. Um, often it just gets so technical so fast. The other thing that's interesting and really ties to a key lesson of how the brain actually works is there's very rarely a strong, clear narrative flow in these decks. They lurch between topic to topic, but they never actually create any sort right. of meaningful narrative. And then the third problem of the three is almost always that we are just entirely sender-oriented. We love our product, mm -hmm. our solutions, our features, functions, speeds, and speeds. We can't help ourselves uh, talking about them. We obviously feel more comfortable. This is what the product guys give us or what marketing gives us. And you can end up with a 50, 60, 70 slide <laughs> deck with really no reference to the customer in it. And so most messaging, particularly when you get a more complex or technical solution, almost always exhibits all three of these problems. And for this reason, you really do create some very, very negative sales outcomes as a result. Yeah. And the, 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 the first one there, the too much information is an interesting one because somewhere back in the, uh, back in the, the dark ages, somebody once created a PowerPoint slide and a, a, or a PowerPoint deck and decided that you needed to have your mission and your vision on it. Then you needed <laughs> to have your, you needed to have all the logos, people you work with, you needed yeah. to, have, so yeah. you needed to have at least 10, 10 slides at the beginning before you ever spoke about anything relevant. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know who, I don't know who started that, but it seems to have become like almost a template. I, I think the, I think you're getting at a really interesting point here that this has become a default way of doing it. 
Um, and what you're describing there is this one, sender orientation, mm -hmm. our mission, our vision, our values. Mm -hmm. This is a classic example. This is a deck from a quite a successful technology company, eight pages. Can you see this? Pictures of their buildings. Mm -hmm. And when you're done with that architectural digest, then you get to mission, vision, and values. Uh, it, what's happening here is we're telling a story that seems logical to us, like we have lots of interesting building and great values. That is entirely sender oriented and we may end up talking about this later but in any meeting that's giving the customer the reason they're looking for to disengage in a virtual meeting they are gone and you will not be getting them back so again this is not a morally neutral problem this creates some very serious outcomes problems yeah so how do you start on the process then of you know, taking something like that, say if you, and I would encourage anybody take a look at your sales decks and uh, see if <laughs> what, what, uh, what Tim just wrote there um, resonates, but what's the, what's the first, what's the starting point in, in turning this around and, and like you said, getting it more um, receiver oriented or the sender oriented? It's a great question. I think that that train goes through two stations. The first thing you've got to get much, much clearer on is what is the goal? What are you actually trying to accomplish? I mean, there's one that's really obvious. There's one that people don't even think about. The obvious one is we're trying to create impact. We're trying to create messaging that is compelling, that drives people to action. The other thing, though, and this, I think, is a very profound moment, is you have got to create messaging that passes the retellability standard. What, what do I mean by that? This is the most important thing you need to understand about sales messaging. Yeah, this is you, and you're pitching some product or solution for the sake of simplicity to one person at the customer. Is that meeting important? Yeah. Is it the most important meeting? No, not even close, because this person is never the sole decision maker, and they're never going to make uh, the decision in that meeting. Sometime later, let's say this is you, John, sometime later, there's another meeting. It's a meeting that that salesperson doesn't get invited to. And at that meeting, the success of the sale hinges not on how impactful this meeting was, but actually on how able this person is to retell that story effectively to this group, which is the, the decision-making body. And the reason I wanted to start here is every one of us sets the wrong standard. We all set the standard of first meeting success. That's mm -hmm. not irrelevant, but that's not the standard. The standard for sales messaging so crisp, so clean, so compelling that this guy is, is motivated and able to tell the story here. So the place you have to start is understanding what you're trying to build. For example, we all build messaging to persuade. Everybody does that. Mm -hmm. But yep. if I ask the thousand sales message uh, sales leaders, do you build sales messaging to equip? They'll say, no, I've never even thought about that. But it is equally as important that the message you've built equips John as it persuades him. Mm -hmm. So the foundational thing you have to understand in messaging is what are you trying to achieve with it? You're not just trying to create first meeting impact. You're trying to create re impact and retellability. So the message thrives here, which is actually where sales pursuits go to live or die. So with that, with that foundation, then you can start to actually build a message. And mm -hmm. the way you build a message is you're going to have to take the content, some or all of it would have been in here, and you right. have to completely rethink the way you construct it. So if you're interested, this is a message we built with Cisco Systems. Actually, I think we're on WebEx today. This is their messaging for WebEx. It goes from 50, 60 slides to this bifold. Now, there's an appendix mm -hmm. for those secondary stuff, but it's sure. absolutely possible to tell a story in a very synthesized way. You talked about decks. I actually don't believe in using PowerPoint when I present to sell or otherwise. If I did, I could, but I would never have more than five slides, ever. I would mm -hmm. never have more than five slides. And it would reflect, I think, this, this narrative architecture. What are you trying to do here? I can give you a few hallmarks. N number one, You've got to start with a philosophical belief that it's got to be incredibly crisp and clean and simple because you go back to this too much information problem. It doesn't just irritate people. You violate their brain bandwidth. And if they shut down because they're cognitively overloaded, there's actually very strong neuroscience behind this. 
you cannot possibly get them where you need them to go because in fact they they cognitively switched off. <laughs> the second thing you do is you must reorient away from any of the sender orientation. You have to deeply root your message in the customer problem. And I'm not talking about some you know, random reference to a problem. I'm talking about a deep and carefully mm -hmm. unpacked narrative on the customer problem. In fact, best practice is typically you want one third of the sales conversation to be about the customer problem. And that sounds obvious, but nobody does this. I, mm -hmm. I, I've looked at a thousand decks this year. Half of them never even mentioned the customer problem. It was at best inferred. The other half, or, or, or 30, 40%, briefly touched on it, but they ran straight to their solution. But just look at this. The front cover of this does not say WebEx 4.0. It says, mm -hmm. with so many tools to communicate, why do your global teams still feel so disconnected? We yeah. often have here what we call the challenge question. What is the fundamental problem I am here to talk to you about? You never go near your solution until you've covered that. And in fact, in this case, there is a detailed unpacking of what happens when collaboration goes wrong at a company. Mm -hmm. You get this wrong, you're, you're completely dead because the customer has no reason to listen to you. Third hallmark, I'm not going to go through all seven. There are seven hallmarks sure. to a great message, but the third one is your value proposition which mm -hmm. is simply your ability to solve this problem has to be expressed using a small number of ideas. It's not 50 slides of garbage and right. crap and data, but the, the brain traffics in ideas. If you, if you were going to sort of, you know, in half an hour when we're done here or 10 minutes, and somebody mm -hmm. says, you know, John, what was that English guy talking about? <laughs> you don't have a recording in your brain, at least. You do have a recording of the conversation, what your brain is going to do is it's going to boil what I've said to a small number of ideas. So you might say, really interesting. He talked about retellability being the standard yep. for messaging. So what I'm getting at here is the brain stores information as ideas. Those are the parcels the brain stores. So wouldn't we want, as a communicator, to land a small number of yeah. big ideas? So a typical big idea in sales is... Our solution is incredibly easy to deploy. So a great sales message will typically have three to four powerful ideas that capture your value as they pertain mm -hmm. to solving this problem. There's a few other hallmarks, but, but I'll finish on one. The final hallmark, which actually is our seventh, but it doesn't matter, is what you really, really want to do if you want to get really good at this. You build a document, not any old document, not some mm -hmm. crappy slide deck, a document specifically designed for retellability. Right. And no slide deck meets that standard. You might be able to present this slide deck to somebody and make these bad slides work. They're never <laughs> going to represent it. So actually what we specialize in really is helping companies get to a document um, typically, this bifold is a very strong format or something we call the five slide model, but it's entirely built for retellability. And we have literally countless cases where companies have made sales pitches to their clients and then they've got a deal with no further meeting needed because mm -hmm. the story was able to be spread by the champion. Uh, in that meeting. So yeah. that's a very quick answer to a very interesting question. How do you take this pile of crap, which is the technical <laughs> word for it, and turn it into this narrative? There's a whole bunch of tools that sit underneath mm -hmm. it. We have tools that are like a how do you do a problem deconstruction, tools that get you to this, but that's basically the before and after you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, there's a, and there's a there's a bunch of really interesting things I want to come back on. Um, the first one is the retailability, uh, because retail retailability, because I think I think I was going to say retailability, yeah, um, is because I think a lot of people, if they take a step back for a moment and ask themselves, how often have they had that first meeting? It's gone great, everything's fantastic, really clicked with them, and then they say, okay, well, I'm going to go back and talk to some people, right? And then you never hear from them again, or they suddenly yeah. go very quiet or, or something like that. So I think that's something that can resonate with an awful lot of people, because you're right. We tend to just look at the obstacle in front of us and think, if we persuade this that's, one person, we're good. That's so well said. You know, how many times sales guys come out of meetings like, yeah, I crushed it. 
And then you hear three weeks later, yeah, they're not moving further forward. And you're like, well, hang on a minute. Where did that disconnect happen? It's because you set the wrong standard. This is the most profound thing I'm going to say today by far is if the one thing that your listeners take away, stop even thinking about first meeting success. You have to build a story with the goal of creating second meeting success, which is why it's got to be incredibly simple. It's got to have a profound anchoring in the customer problem, a very resonant value prop with ideas. And this document is everything. By the way, unaided recall of any information, this is proven for 50 years of psychology, unaided recall of anything will never exceed 10%. So if you give this guy a crappy deck or nothing, he or she is relying on their memory, which will never retrieve more than 10% of the argument. And by the way, it also tends to be a very random 10%. You can't win that battle, so don't play. Play the aided recall battle. Mm, Give them, have a great message embedded in a great document. I'm not kidding. I've played this game a thousand times. We can't do it now. But John, I could present this WebEx message to you now for 20 minutes. I could give you five minutes and then have you present it to someone else. And because this document is so good and it follows the narrative so closely, you would be able to do it almost flawlessly. And that's right. that's what you're after. So I think if one of the big things people take away is start thinking about, am I giving my customer a story that they can retell, particularly and am I embedding it in a document that then enables that? That change alone, especially if you follow this narrative structure, can bring or does bring dramatic improvements in sales outcomes. Yeah, no, I I, I agree, and I think it's a and I think it's a, it's a critical piece because yeah, there's uh, um, there's so often there's these times when when there's gatekeepers or there's people stopping you getting to the next level and all of that. Yeah. And, and the best way around it is to equip. The other thing I just wanted to pick up on there, it was interesting. You said like you have your you know, very crisp uh, value propositions, how you can solve the problem, but you keep them relatively contained, right? And a a certain number of them, because there's another thing, the trap that people fall into, and it's a particular thing adults do, it's, uh, you know, it's argument dilution, which you would know about. Um, If you ever, if you ever had a child come to you and say, I want you to take me to the theme park because there's a new roller coaster, right? And uh-huh. you know they would say, "Well, we can't today because." Of, but there's a new roller coaster. You say, "But it's the biggest and it's new." And and they'll just <laughs> stick on. They'll just stick on the main argument theme. Adults will start to add in and add it. And if you're not reacting, we we tend to think that more is better. So we continue yep. to add more and more items. And I think we do that a lot in the sales pitches too, as opposed to keeping it succinct. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, again, you're 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 starting to cross reference to this problem of yeah. too much information. Um, people will often ask me, you know, what do I think? What do I think is the number one hallmark of being an effective communicator? I can go a lot of different ways there. You can talk about retellability, but again, if you wanted an unbelievably load bearing idea, what is fundamentally wrong with a deck like this? One of the things that's wrong with it is it completely fails to. I love your kid with the theme park example. Mm -hmm. it completely fails to distinguish between what's primary and what's secondary. Mm -hmm. And all of that stuff gets smooshed together. Now, what happens is now two different things. One is you don't get any focus on the primary because the secondary is in there and it's completely diluting the message. Somewhere in this technology deck were two or three slides that were absolutely gold. I, mm. They weren't well structured, but they, the, the material could have been there. But these get completely lost and buried. The other thing is the secondary stuff does not just dilute the primary, but it distracts from it. If mm. I present, there's a role in communication. Anything you put in front of an audience, it's fair game for them to talk about. How many times have you been in sales? You put in some trivial point that you really didn't want to talk about, and then the customer starts talking about it. You're like, damn it. I just burned 20 minutes on that. So this stuff, the secondary stuff doesn't just dilute the primary. It gives the customer a perfect opportunity to drag you off into some briar patch from which you can never return. One of the, the greatest skills in sales is distinguishing primary from secondary. Hence, the first hallmark is incredibly uh, crisp and clean and simple. 
And um, I'll show you what that looks like, Bryce. Do we have the appendix? This is a message we built with a company called Graybar, amazing company, uh, electrical distributors. This is the core message for a one-hour conversation. This is the appendix, which covers all of the secondary detail if it's needed. Now, this is incredibly smart. Firstly, the customer notices, like, wow, these guys actually knew what was primary and secondary. The other thing is salespeople will typically say, oh, I'm going to be in the secondary meeting in the content all the time. Our experience with clients is this gets opened maybe 5% of the meetings. You can absolutely carry an amazing sales conversation, especially early in the sales process, off a very simple narrative document. This is uh, Cisco. In fact, we're working a lot with IBM at the moment. IBM have pushed it even further. Now, admittedly, the font size has gotten a little small. <laughs> IBM are now communicating very complex solutions on one page. And one of the reasons they did that is because people are printing documents at home when, when they're working virtually. So um, you are 100% right. The kid's fixation on the theme park ride tells me that that kid understands what's primary and secondary. He isn't going down the route of, look, I want to go to the ride. I also think the popcorn's nice. Yeah. We'll have good family fellowship when we drive. The kid's smart enough not to let the secondary <laughs> crowd it all out. And as you say, we somehow forget that as adults. I love the metaphor. I'm probably going to steal that. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I think I stole it from someone else. So it's all just passed hand, handed down. Um, <laughs> listen... Listen, this is this has been this has been fantastic. Such fast, such fascinating stuff, and I know we only scratched the surface of it. Um, and all of Tim's information will obviously be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what your company does. You know, the company is uh, Aratium from the Latin root uh, of the same word you get oratory, and uh, it, it's basically about how do you construct an, an oral argument. About 80 percent of our work is with B two B sales messaging. About 30% of our work is with executive communications because, again, if you're a CEO and you're getting your strategy message to the company wrong or to Wall Street, then, then very bad things happen. Um, we do everything from training, teaching people how to apply this model. That's what we really love doing. Sometimes with companies, they just need a key message for like a new product, and we build that. So we have kind of a teaching model and a, and a doing model, and we work with very large companies, or we work with startups. You know, how do you – message your startup to go and raise funding or to improve the way you tell the story in the marketplace. So uh, people are welcome to connect with me if you want to put my email on there or over LinkedIn is a good one um, or just aratium.com. Um, I did a TED talk uh, back in the spring. Uh, I had the pleasure of it being the seventh most watched TED talk in the world this summer, which is, wow. I wish I could retire on that. But um, that's also a fun one because that talk actually lays out the tool by which you develop the ideas in an argument or value proposition. So you can Google me or go on YouTube and look for the TED Talk. So, but please feel free, you know, people can reach out to us. We can chat a little bit about our e-learning or what we do if, if that's what people would like to do. Yeah, listen, fantastic. And like I said, I mean, such such fantastic information. And if we could, if if through this video and through Tim's work, if we could reduce those 50 page PowerPoints or all take them to extinction i think the world yeah. would be a better place <laughs> yeah. and we could say and we'd probably save a lot of trees from people who end up printing out 50 page decks yeah there's no future for communication <laughs> like that um i don't believe decks decks there's a whole other story about why decks exist and what's the intellectual laziness that gets you to this but once you get to this model you never look back you, you, you know, you yeah. can't unsee this. Once you get to this, you wouldn't in a million years throw one of these together. We love seeing that transformation take place at a company where they start self-regulating away right. from that. They have one model for communication, which is completely <laughs> transformed. And, and by the way, you think customers are looking forward to that next monster deck? Customers mm. love it when you present to them in this way. In fact, we've had so many stories. Our clients have told us their customers have actually thanked them for communicating in this way because they're so tired of being oh, fire hosed yeah. with these decks. So it's kind of a win-win-win, really. Oh, yeah. No, I, I could totally relate to that. Absolutely. Well, um, listen, as I said, Tim, this has been fantastic. Great information. All of thank Tim's you. information will be below this. Um, thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon. 
Thank you, Joe.